Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Did the president snub his own party? We'll ask House Freedom Caucus member Jim Jordan. That's next. President Trump has infuriated Republicans and surprised Democrats with his decision this week on how to get funding for Hurricane Harvey through Congress. But how real is his new partnership with Chuck and Nancy? Joining me here in Washington is Congressman Jim Jordan, a founding member of the House Freedom Caucus of hardline conservatives. Congressman, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good to be with you, Chris. Uh, I want to start with the deal that shook Washington. President Trump siding with Pelosi and Schumer over his own Republican leaders, over his own Treasury Secretary in his effort to link Harvey disaster relief funding to a three-month extension, yeah. a three-month extension of government funding and the debt limit, and even talking about a deal on DACA. Uh, here's the president on Air Force One. Chuck and Nancy would like to see something happen, and so do I. And I said, if we can get something to happen, we're going to sign it, and we're going to make it, we're going to make a lot of happy people. Congressman, are you one of those happy people? No, I, I don't think this was a, was a good, good deal uh, for the American taxpayer. We didn't do anything to address the underlying $20 trillion debt problem. But frankly, what options did the president have in front of him? The first time the Republican conference talked about the debt ceiling was Wednesday morning. And the Freedom Caucus, we had called for nine and a half weeks ago, Chris. We, had, we did a press conference and we said, don't leave town until you actually have a plan on the debt ceiling and outline the tax uh, reform plan that we're going to do and until we deal with health care. And instead, we went home for the longest August recess in a non-election year, longest break in a non-election year for more than the, the, the last decade. So the, the break was even longer than some breaks you have in an election year. And you know how politicians like to be home in election time. So that was the problem. We should have stayed here and put together a plan. We offered ideas in the Freedom Caucus. I said, let's cap spending as a percentage of GDP and I'll raise the debt ceiling. So the, the problem here is we didn't address the underlying problem. The problem wasn't a three months, six month time frame. You know, I, I learned a long time ago that when you fail to prepare, you get a bad outcome. Well, there, and that's there, what happened here. There are two issues. One is your concern and the concern of a lot of conservatives that you didn't get anything in return for raising the debt limit, that you Which didn't get almost every other time you, you raise it, didn't debt get uh, spending cuts. There's another issue, and that is the significance of giving Schumer and Pelosi all this leverage when the issue comes up again in in the case of government funding in in December and maybe shortly thereafter on the debt limit. And, and the question I have for you, giving the Democrats, the Democratic leadership more leverage, is that good or bad for the Trump agenda when it comes to tax cuts and immigration and Obamacare? I, I don't I don't look at it in that light. I look at it as a good or bad for the American people. You know, I say this all the time. Our job's pretty basic. What do we tell the American people we're going to do at election time? What did they elect us here, uh, send us here to accomplish? Let's focus on that. So I don't think it's good for the American taxpayer. I don't think it's good for the American people. That, to me, is the focus. Why, but again, why isn't I, I, it good? Well, when you, when you just raise the debt ceiling and don't do anything to address the underlying problem, I mean, this is like your, your kid at college who's got your credit card and he's spending more than he takes in and he's already piled up a lot of debt and he gets to say, oh, for the next three months, I got unlimited borrowing authority. I think if that was your son or my son, we'd have a problem with that. that that's what this deal, in essence, did. So but, that's but what why about it's not the fact good for that the you're taxpayer. giving the Democrats another bite at the apple on all those issues in December. Uh, Chris, I'm an, I'm, I'm an American. You have to be an optimist. So I look at it this way we get another bite at the apple. We're going to put forward a plan that says let's cap spending. This is where we, the Freedom Caucus, we took a position. Let's cap spending as a percentage of GDP. Let's bring spending back down to its modern times historic norm below 20% of gross domestic product. And then let's get this economy growing. I do agree with the president. We need to go, uh, focus on tax cuts. We need that because that's going to give us the kind of growth we need to deal with a $20 trillion debt burden. But I look at this as an optimistic f f uh, from the Republican side as well. We have a chance now to put together a plan, take that case to the American people early, not wait till the last minute like we did before, and sell that plan to the American people and pass that. But what do you think of the idea of this alliance between the president and, as he calls them, Chuck and Nancy? Do you see... Are you concerned about the possibility that he might go with them? I think, uh, I think the president is focused on doing what uh, he told the American people he was going to do, cutting their taxes, building a border security wall, dealing with Obamacare, all those yeah, issues. Wait, wait, wait. Chuck, Pennsylvania, Chuck, Chuck Ohio, and Nancy, Michigan, but Chuck and Nancy voted for are against repealing Obamacare. Chuck and Nancy are against funding for the wall. Chuck and Nancy have a very different idea of, of, of tax cuts 
than the president does and you do. I know. And that's why we got to get our plan out there and push it early and take the case to the American people. And I think if we do that, we can win. I think this was a unique situation where, unfortunately, there wasn't any good options presented to the. You know, I learned a long time. My background is a sport of wrestling. You don't you don't prepare. You're not going to you don't do the, 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 the preparation and go to. We didn't even have a practice to figure out what we were going to do to to give a good plan to the president. So that's the problem. I think this is a unique situation, not what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen in the future, I think, with this president and certainly with us conservatives in the House is we're solely and 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 totally focused on what the American people elected us to do. I, I just want to press this one more time because there were always doubts about whether or not this president was a true conservative. You heard it from a lot of folks on the right, members of the Freedom Caucus. Do you worry that he may be more interested now in scoring victories than he is in pushing a true conservative agenda? What, what I worry about is, I hate to keep saying it, but it's, it's what drives the, our, our mission statement the Freedom Caucus is. The countless number of people who feel like this town's forgotten them, our job is to remember them and fight for them. I think President Trump has that same vision, that same focus. In this situation, he wasn't presented with good options. He does want to get focused on tax reform. I get all that. So we got to make sure we, we push forward the things the American people elect us to do, give those options to the president. And I'm confident when that happens, he will pick those options that are conservative and are consistent with what the American people elected us to accomplish. Given what you've just said, do you have full confidence in House Speaker Paul Ryan? Yeah, no one's, I mean, there was this, these stories that, uh, what, what one story said, uh, Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan met with the speaker. I mean, well, that's hardly news. We meet with the speaker every single week. No one's talking about changing in leadership. What we're talking about is just what I said. What was the, what was the agenda the American people voted but, but, for on November 8th? Let's get that done. But you say there's no gonna, interest in cha changing the speaker, and I'm not <laughs> pushing you to do so, but you're saying you offered ideas. You wanted to stay in session in August to come up with a solid, serious plan to tie raising the debt limit to spending cuts. Yep. You did, the House and Senate leadership of your party didn't come up with that. Right, and that was a mistake. We well, should have stayed. I think, I think in hindsight, is I think we were, well, it wasn't ours because we called for staying. So we were willing to it? stay. Well, you know, leadership makes a schedule, not, not, not Jim Jordan. So uh, we should have stayed here. I think if you ask the American people, should we stay here and get done what you sent us here to get done? I think they would overwhelmingly say, well, heck yes, you should. And the fact that you didn't, again, the longest non-election year break in over a decade, that's really what we're supposed to be doing when we're trying to get these critical things done at a time when we got a twenty trillion dollar debt at a time when our border security is not where it needs to be according to i mean th that's the kind of thing we got to focus on on friday treasury secretary this is before you guys took the vote and you were one of the ninety republicans who voted against yep. the whole package uh... treasury secretary mnuchin uh, and the budget chief, Mick Mulvaney, came to meet with House Republicans to try to get you to pass uh, the Harvey package. A couple of questions I want to ask you. Widely reported, is it true that Mnuchin asked the caucus to pass the debt limit for him? Uh, I don't recall it being framed that way. I do recall them making a, you know, a strong case for us to vote for it. Uh, of course, there, were, there was pushback from members, like you would expect, because when you have a $20 trillion problem, you probably shouldn't just allow unlimited borrowing authority for the federal government <clears throat> for the next three months without doing anything to address the $20 trillion problem. Now, to me, that is just common sense. But again, that's where we wound up. They were pushing for it. And, um, you know, 90 of us said this is not a good deal for the American taxpayer. Well, that brings it. me to my final question. Mick Mulvaney, who used to be a member of the House Freedom yep. Caucus, a budget hawk, I emphasize, I see the smile on your face, used to be, he wouldn't commit, as I understand it, that when the debt limit comes up again in December or shortly thereafter, that you will tie it to spending cuts. And I want to ask you about that, one, and two, the fact that the president is now talking with Chuck Schumer about doing away with any vote on the debt limit. You basically lose the opportunity well, to use that as a tool. Yeah, that's, a, that's a bad idea. I mean, again, go back to the example of the co your, your college son who's got the credit card. He, he wants to say, I want to raise the limit, Dad, and I don't even have to even talk to you about it. I, I think that is just a, 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 particularly when you have the debt burden that we currently have. So that, that is a, 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 a bad idea. Look, all the more reason why we need to have a plan early I mean, this is politics. You put together your argument, your plan, and you take the case to the American people. And I'm confident if you said to the American people, we are going to raise the debt ceiling. That is important. There, there's the financial markets. We understand how important that is. But 
we are not going to do that unless we address the problem. Why don't we cap spending and get it back down to the historic levels in modern times below 20% of GDP? I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a phase down. That's the kind of approach. You take that to the case to the American people, you do it early enough, you do the preparation early enough, you can actually win the match. Congressman Jordan, thank you. Thank you. And I tell you, I'm going to make sure my kids, I, I'm taking all their credit cards away. Good, good, good move. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss the new balance of power in Washington. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about President Trump's deal with the Democrats? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, the whole Republican leadership group. And I'll tell you what, we walked out of there, Mitch and Paul and everybody, Kevin, and we walked out and everybody was happy. President Trump bragging after his deal with Democrats to link Harvey aid to a short-term plan to fund the government and lift the debt ceiling. And it's time now for our Sunday group, Fox News senior political analyst, Britt Hume, columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams, Mo Alethi of Georgetown University's Institute of Politics and Public Service, and former National Security Council staffer Jillian Turner. Britt, I want to follow up with what my conversation with the congressman. What do you make of the president siding with, and I can't say it enough, Chuck and Nancy, I, I love that phrase, and undercutting not only Republican senators, but his own Treasury Secretary is in the middle of making his pitch in the Oval Office when the president said decided everybody with was that. happy. I think uh, no doubt Chuck and Nancy were happy. <laughs> it, it, he got rolled. The president got rolled, and his administration therefore got rolled because, as you pointed out correctly, doing this short-term deal attached to the Hurricane Harvey money, which was a must-pass, and therefore a good vehicle to do a longer debt limit extension and perhaps other things as well, is now a three-month deal. And we're right back where we started, except without the Hurricane Harvey leverage when December rolls around. So it's a terrible deal. And I think the president, he wanted to sign something, so he got something to sign, but he got, he got rolled. Is it a one-time thing, or do you believe uh, that... Well, I, look, you listed correctly for your guests the different issues that now are coming along, you know, tax reform, the border wall, and the rest of it. Obamacare. Obamacare. Chuck and Nancy are not going to be with him on those things. So this, this, this new so-called so alliance, it seems to me, is, is more likely to be a one-off than it is the beginning of some new coalition that's going to last and abolish, as a New York Times headline suggested today, two-party rule. It's ridiculous. I, I talked with a number of Republicans on the Hill over the last few days, and the two words that I kept hearing from them were flabbergasted and seething. And I would definitely put Republican Senator Ben Sass in the latter category. Here he is. Chuck Schumer, whose title is minority leader, not majority leader, just made himself the most powerful man in America for the month of December. This is an embarrassing moment for a Republican-controlled Congress and a Republican administration. Mo, extending the debt limit and funding for just three months, how much leverage does that give Pelosi and Schumer? I, look, I think, uh, and I, I think Britt was, was right in that the president has just lost a lot of leverage moving forward, and the Republican Party has just lost a lot of leverage moving forward. I, I don't think anyone should be all that surprised by what the president did and for a lot of reasons not the least of which is he proved during the campaign that he was not a partisan or an ideologically driven kind of guy that he was the kind of guy who is going to kind of look out for himself first and here he was with the ability to cut a deal with the democrats that would be completely antithetical to what his own party would want and frankly, antithetical to what he himself in the past had said, right? I mean, just wasn't that long ago that he was out there tweeting, uh, attacking the Republicans in Congress when they did a four-month deal to extend the debt ceiling difference, saying it was, he was a terrible negotiator. Look, I don't, I, I'm, I'm with Britain in the sense that I don't think this is a new alliance. I don't think this is a new balance of power. I don't think Democrats are going to get everything that they want from this president moving forward. But I think what it showed is that this president is not as strong of a negotiator as he made himself out to be. And that is something Something that Democrats are probably going to try to uh, uh, take advantage of as much as they possibly can. We ask you for questions for the panel. And on this issue of the president's deal with the Democrats, a lot of you were as surprised as we were. Beer POTUS tweeted, will this lead to bipartisan legislation in the future or did the Dems just pull one over on Trump with this deal? 
But Rick Conner sent this on Facebook. Since the Republicans have dragged their feet on every bit of the president's agenda, who can blame him for trying to find someone in D.C. that will help him? Jillian, how do you answer them? I would say I agree with Mo and Britt that the president has given up some leverage here in the short term. But to me, that's a tactical problem. And I think this deal really is a strategic victory for the president what, in the, the sense months? that the three months strategic because victory. I think at this at this moment, the terms of this particular deal are less important than the fact that the president is showing that he can make a deal. This has been the the sad story of the first six, seven, eight months of the administration has been somebody who ran on the platform of being a deal maker has been unable to cut deals where it really matters for the American people so far on health care, gearing up for a big battle on the national economy. I think for the American people, forget the political class in Washington, they don't care so much as we do as the, you know, the question you discussed a few moments ago with the congressman, is the president a true conservative? For them, the question is, is the president a true deal maker? Is he really going to be able to prove his mettle on these issues where, where we need him to come forward? We, they want him to be bipartisan. I think that is more important here than the particulars but, that but went into But the question this. to me, Juan, is what is the deal about? And, and if you're talking about deal, working with Chuck and Nancy, their positions on issues that people care about a lot more than whether or not the president got a deal on border security, on Obamacare, on tax cuts, they're diametrically opposed, I think. I agree with you. I mean, so if we were to pick out one point where you would say there is some common ground, it would be infrastructure spending. But again, Republicans are going to say, wait a minute, what about the cost? And how are you going to compensate if you're going to put a big lump of money into infrastructure? But on, as you pointed out, tax reform, he wants cuts for upper brackets and the corporations. They want tax reform that would benefit middle class voters. You think about the wall, clearly they don't support the wall, and Obamacare looms large. He wants to repeal it, they want to improve it. But I would say this, I, I am taken by the idea that this president, we've heard so much talk from my fellow uh, panelists this morning about the notion that he's a deal maker. But I just gotta wonder, you know, we're going into an election year, 2018. I don't see that he's gonna get any better deal from the Democrats in an election year, and certainly not at Christmas time when everybody's dying to get out of town. It seems to me, if you look forward, and I'm, I guess I'm speaking to you, Jillian, that he just gave up all leverage, <laughs> that, that the deal that's coming on the budget will not have anything for the Republicans or for conservatives. But you I, can always make a deal if you're willing to capitulate to the right. other side's demands, which is essentially what the president did. So I don't think it says very much that, uh, or, or is it redounds to his favor that he made this deal, because it's such a bad deal. All right. I guess we've all weighed in on that. <laughs> Strong letter to follow. Panel, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, a lot of focus this week on Irma and the president's deal with the Democrats, but there is other news. Hillary Clinton talks, and so does Steve Bannon. And North Korea surprises the world by not launching a missile. We'll get to all of that. Plus, we'll go back live to the storm zone for the latest on the hurricane. Composure, which I have developed over years being in the public eye, has well equipped me for being a leader. But I think in this time we're in, particularly in this campaign, you know, maybe I missed a few chances. Former Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton pushing her new book, What Happened?, expressing regret. She didn't tell Donald Trump to back off when he crowded her in their second debate. And we're back now with a panel. Well, Mo, in the book, Hillary Clinton blames almost everything on almost everybody, from the Russians to James Comey, Bernie Sanders to Matt Lauer. Occasionally, rarely, she takes personal responsibility. How happy are Democrats that Mrs. Clinton is going to be spending the next two months rehashing her defeat? So first, let me say, I think, um, you know, in an election that was decided by, what, 70,000 votes over just a couple of states, it's all right. Everything had an impact, whether it was Russia, whether it was the Comey, and yes, the, her own strategic mistakes, which uh, from the excerpts I've seen of this book, she is speaking about more candidly than she has up till this point. Um, and so um, uh, you're seeing, I think, her take more responsibility uh, for the loss, but also pointing to some of the other, some of the other factors. And I think that's what people have been criticizing her for not doing 
up till now. Do you so think it's helpful to Democrats forward. to revisit the Clinton defeat? You know, I think there's going to be a huge rush of publicity around this now. I think moving forward, Democrats need to be looking forward. So I don't think there's a problem with reflecting on what happened if we're truly learning from those mistakes. And I think the parts that she's taking responsibility for about the fact that you know some of the excerpts I read where she talked about how she missed the, the, the mood of the country right now, that is something Democrats do need to understand before we head into 2018 so that they don't make those same mistakes again. Juan, why do you think she's doing it? Do you think it, she's trying to make a buck and there's nothing wrong with that, that she's trying to rehabilitate her legacy and will it work? Well, you know how these reporters are. They're like, they're like wolves, Chris. And I, so here, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was money. <laughs> yes, I think my, apparently pre-sales for the book are off the chart. Uh, so, you know, but, uh, and also I think attention. I think she and her husband love the limelight and it certainly is bringing them. We're having this conversation here. Do you think it's helpful for the Democrats? Well, I think if Camilla Harris and Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren and Patty Murray, you know, you know, Amy Klobuchar, if they can't get out there and establish themselves in this environment, they're not going to do it. I don't see the Clinton seeding power or prominence in the party as a convenience to them. I think from the political standpoint, I pick up on something Mo was talking about, which is I think Hillary Clinton believes in buyer's remorse and thinks that a lot of voters, especially in those swing states, we're talking Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, have gone back. So you get a lot of people who were so-called Reagan Democrats, swing voters, who now say, you know, boy, Donald Trump hasn't delivered for me. And their hope, I think that gives Clinton hope that she may have a future here, which is... Future? You yes, that's what... Again? I don't know. I'm just thinking to myself today. Last night, I was having a conversation like that with somebody who says this may be the introduction to the Hillary Clinton point two. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> and meanwhile, let's switch subjects. Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon uh, is also talking this weekend, the self-proclaimed enemy of uh, the establishment, the swamp. The mainstream media is coming out this weekend on 60 Minutes of all places uh, to say that he is going to lead the charge against the establishment. Here he is. They do not support the president's program. It's an open secret on Capitol Hill. Everybody in the city knows it. And so, therefore, legislation. now that you're out of the White House, you go into war with Absolutely. him. Absolutely. Brett, how much of a player do you think Steve Bannon is going to be in national politics? How much clout do you think he'll have? I think much less of a player than a lot of media accounts and current speculation suggest. Uh, Breitbart News, which is a popular website, is not the same as being in the White House. Uh, his megaphone is tiny by comparison to what he might once have had, uh, although he you know, didn't do a lot of public talking in the White House. I think he mostly did leaking, but I just don't think he's as big a factor as one thinks. He'll get, you know, the 60 Minutes interview will generate some discussion, as indeed it already has. Um, but I don't think from the platform at Breitbart News he's going to be able to wage much of a war against his so-called swamp. You agree with that, Jillian? Yeah, I do. I agree with that. I think, you know, I also think that everybody wants to be the master of their own universe and the center of their own story. And this is a way for him to really create a narrative that puts him at the center of all these things, that creates a narrative for him where he was the one, you know, cherry picking cabinet members for the administration. So it's, it's a little bit of a self-serving journey that he's it on It is interesting, right too, that this guy who talked about the mainstream media comes out in 60 Minutes. Exactly he right. Yeah. As an interview with the New York Times, right. what do you make of that? Well, I mean, he's going where the numbers are. He's going where the viewers and the, and the readers are. The New York Times, for whatever we may think of it in terms of its fairness, is still a very big voice in this town and in this country. And the same is true of 60 Minutes, which is, you know, massively successful and hugely watched. So that's where he went. You notice he didn't, you know, we don't know what he's been saying lately on Breitbart News because, well, it's not the New York Times and it's not 60 Minutes. I still think he's speaking to an audience of one, more than any, though. He knows that this president is moved by media coverage and what he reads in the media more than anything else. And I don't know if the president watches 60 Minutes, but he does get those Breitbart news clips in the morning. And if he see, maybe he believes that if he can stir up enough there, that the president may, may react. I want to get to one more subject, and that is North Korea. Uh, Jillian, there were a lot of predictions that this weekend that the North Koreans were going to launch a missile. It's the 69th anniversary of the founding of that country, and that's the kind of thing that Kim likes to do to celebrate an anniversary. He didn't, but the Trump administration kept up its tough talk. 
Nuclear powers understand their responsibilities. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. Jillian, does this administration have a clear policy on North Korea? Um, I think we've got a, a clear ultimate goal. We, meaning the United States, has a clear ultimate goal, which is not to be Captain Obvious here, but to avoid a nuclear a showdown that produces a nuclear holocaust. I think the strategy is fairly clear. Um, the strategy is to emphasize diplomacy and keep that front and center, but also to maintain a credible threat of military force. And in that sense, the Trump administration strategy is not different from the Obama administration, from the Bush administration, even going back to the Clinton administration. So you don't take this We've tough talk that consistent. seriously? I take it seriously, but I think that it's a rhetorical difference. I don't think it's a substantive policy difference between President Trump and his predecessors. Thank you, panel. See you next Sunday. We'll be right back with a live report from Miami on the latest with Hurricane Irma. A look at the wind kicking up in Tampa as Hurricane Irma comes ashore this morning. Let's check in with Phil Keating live in Miami on Florida's east coast with the latest there. Phil. Good, very miserable morning to you, Chris. It's been like this for 12 hours now in South Florida, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties. Pounding rains, howling winds, and it's going to go on for at least another 12 hours. We just had a report of a 100-mile-an-hour wind gust at Miami International Airport. 70-mile-an-hour gusts have been reported up at Fort Lauderdale as well. These are spawning tornadoes, at least two confirmed so far since last night. As far as power outages, very widespread already. More than a million Floridians now without power in Florida Power and Lot, a major utility, estimates by the end of it all, three million of its accounts will be without power. That probably means about five million people there. Duke Energy also says a million of its accounts will be offline before this storm goes away. And the utility crews aren't coming out to fix anything until after everything has gone and moved through. Tornadoes have been reported. The one was reported at Homestead International Raceway. And if you take a look at this one piece of video from the last Hurricane Hunter flight into Hurricane Irma from up above the system, it looks like a monster because it is a monster. Look at that eye wall. And the worst thing is for all of the people that now live due north of the center of the storm as the eye wall had lasted through Key West, Kajo Key, early this morning around 8 a.m. It's now moving up towards Everglades National Park, Marco Island, Fort Myers, Sarasota, and then the Tampa Bay region. It could be potentially devastating with a storm surge of up to 15 feet. Chris, back to you. Phil Keating reporting from Miami. Phil, thank you. And we say to the whole Fox News crew and everybody in Florida, please stay safe. Here's one more look at Irma as it moves up the west coast of Florida. Please stay tuned to Fox News Channel for all day coverage of the hurricane. Our thoughts are with all of you in the storm's path. And that's it for today. Have a great week and we'll see you next Fox News Sunday. It has never seen anything like it. Unfortunately, I don't believe all citizens understand the magnitude of what's about to happen. We're live in the storm zone with the latest on Irma, where it's headed, the potential danger, and we'll find out how authorities will respond from Florida Governor Rick Scott and FEMA Chief Rock Law. Then the president strikes a surprise deal with the Democrats. Then a Democratic leader. Chuck Schumer, he, he could speak New York to the president. We'll discuss what it means for the president's relationship with the GOP and the Trump agenda with Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, founding member of the hardline House Freedom Caucus. Plus, what should we make of the president's new alliance with Chuck and Nancy? We'll ask our Sunday panel how long it will last. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. Here's where we stand with Hurricane Irma right now. The eye of the most powerful Atlantic hurricane ever recorded now moving across the Florida Keys with maximum sustained winds of 130 miles per hour. The storm expected to inflict damage not seen in Florida since Hurricane Andrew 25 years ago. 
A record 7 million people in Florida and neighboring states under evacuation orders. Its path projected along Florida's Gulf Coast from Naples to Tampa Bay. In a moment, we'll discuss the threat and the response with FEMA Administrator Brock Long and Florida Governor Rick Scott. But first, we have Fox team coverage. Chief Meteorologist Rick Reichmuth tells us where Irma is headed. Bill Hemmer on the flo emergency facing Florida. But we begin with Adam Housley and Key Largo in the storm's crosshairs right now. Adam. Yeah, Chris, you talk about the storm's crosshairs. Here in Key Largo, the winds have been battering this part of Florida for more than 24 hours. In fact, uh, at 10.30 yesterday morning, we lost power here, and the winds have not died down. They continue to grow. Right now, you can tell that the wind is gusting over 100 miles an hour from where I'm standing. I'm going to step away for a second to give you an idea of the storm's wrath and the rage of this storm. The eye is going to pass about 40 miles, we believe, to our west. So we're right in the what's called the dirty side of the storm. You can see trees bent in half. In fact, across our parking lot from the secure location that we are located, there's a tree about four feet around and snapped about 10 feet above ground. You know, I've been in 10 hurricanes. But I got to tell you, this one is the most powerful one I felt this far away from the center. Uh, and it's been just nonstop. We know the storm surge here in Key Largo started yesterday at about 11 p.m. We left the area on the ocean side, so on the east side of the key, the water had already come up about three feet, uh, and it was headed towards the interstate. Here on the uh, bay side, it has not yet gotten that high at all. It's just basically wind and rain that's been battering us. We know that also evacuations here began several days ago. People that stayed for Andrews 25 years ago saw the picture, saw the video coming out of the Caribbean, and said this time they weren't going to stay. Chris, very few people left here in Key Largo, thankfully, as this storm comes ashore. Adam Housley reporting from the Florida Keys right now in the center of the storm. Adam, stay safe. Now, let's turn to Bill Hemmer in Orlando. Bill. Uh, Chris, good morning from Orlando, where the worst is yet to arrive. A much different picture for now here in the central part of the state. 67 counties in the state of Florida. 58 of the 67 counties, Chris, are under hurricane warning. That is just extraordinary. And now it's become a guessing game after hitting landfall in the Keys as to where Irma goes next. 24 hours ago, all the attention on the storm, uh, storm rather, shifted to the West Coast. And now towns like Naples, in Fort Myers and Sarasota and St. Pete's and Tampa, all now bracing for the possibility of severe impact. We were in Tampa yesterday and again last night, and downtown was nearly empty. Evacuation orders given out for more than 6 million statewide, and the governor, Rick Scott, had this final message late yesterday. I'm a dad and I'm a grandfather. I love my family more than anything, and I cannot imagine life without them. Do not put your life or your family's life at risk. Right now is the right time to do the right thing for your family. And the president and his team watching from Camp David over the weekend, tweeting late last night, the U.S. Coast Guard, FEMA, and all federal and state brave people are ready. Here comes Irma. God bless everyone. And tweet. Hotels are sold out. More than 400 shelters have opened, housing more than 120,000 Floridians, and these numbers are massive. Chris, you can drive 50 miles to the east, the Atlantic Ocean and Daytona Beach, or you can drive 80 miles to the west in Tampa, Florida, and the Gulf of Mexico. It is likely over the next 24 hours, the entire width of the state of Florida will feel these hurricane force winds. Never in recorded history has the United States had two Cat 4 hurricanes hit in the same season, but yet it is happening now as we wait here in Orlando. Chris, back to you in Washington. Bill Hemmer reporting for, from Orlando in the calm before the storm there, Bill, thank you. Now let's get the latest track on Irma's path over the next few hours. Chief Meteorologist Rick Reichmuth is in the Fox Weather Center in New York. Rick. Hi, Chris. So first of all, today is the statistical peak of hurricane season, September 10th. Very appropriate. We're watching this storm right now on our shore, uh, continuing to pull off towards the north, uh, a little bit towards the northwest. And that means we're going to be watching 
We've had the first landfall in the Keys. We're going to see another landfall later on today, a little bit farther up the coast. I tell you what, things are just going to get worse. We have hurricane warnings in effect throughout the entire state of Florida, except the far western panhandle. But hurricane warnings go all the way into Georgia. Albany, Georgia, Tifton towards Waycross and Valdosta. Hurricane warnings in effect. Tropical storm warnings in effect all the way towards the North Georgia mountains. So by tomorrow evening, we're going to be seeing winds probably 60 to 70 miles as uh, an hour as far north as Atlanta. Here you go. We always are talking about this track, and this is why it's so misleading. The strong winds extend very far out. We'll see hurricane force winds likely all the way up the state of Florida and then extending in towards Georgia. We're also going to watch a lot of onshore flow. The wind will continue to pull on the east shore of Florida, and that's why we're going to see the storm surge extending all the way up in throughout Georgia and South Carolina. But take a look at the winds gust. Wind gusts, we're watching them in the 100 range, up towards 100. 145 in Marathon Key by noon. We're looking at uh, winds at 115 miles an hour in Naples. This continues by 5 o'clock, still over 100 miles an hour in Naples. By tonight, over hurricane force winds in Tampa. And then by tomorrow morning into the afternoon, we're going to be seeing hurricane force gusts all the way towards southern Georgia. So it's a long duration event, about 36 hours before this finally winds down across the state of Georgia and Alabama. Chris? Rick, thank you. Joining us now live from FEMA headquarters here in Washington is Brock Long, the head of that agency. Mr. Long, how has Irma's swing farther to the west changed your assessment of, of the storm? Has it become more dangerous or less dangerous? Uh, this is a worst case scenario for uh, Monroe County, Florida Keys and the west coast of Florida. Anytime you're in that northeast quadrant um, as a storm is moving forward, that's where uh, the maximum radius winds are that define the intensity of the storm. That's where storm surge is most prevalent. And, and uh, you know, the inland winds are going to be tough. And, and also, you know, 80 percent of your uh, landfall and hurricanes bring with them tornadoes. So we're already seeing some tornado watches and warnings spread across the state. Does Irma's new course put more people in jeopardy? Are folks now in Alabama and Georgia, are they more now in more danger with this new path? So we're in good communication with Alabama as well, and they're, def they're definitely watching this storm. Any shift to the west has implications for them, uh, and we're also in great communication with Georgia as well, because as this thing moves inland, you know, that tornado threat's going to persist. Uh, inland rains are going are, are to persist as well. So uh, we're moving very quickly. The president has uh, been in great communication not only with me, but been moving very swiftly to put the proper declarations in place. And so today it's all about... Uh, you know, as the pres president requested from me last night, he said, uh, do everything you can to take care of people. And that's what we're doing. We're positioning as many teams and commodities in place today and ready to go. Over the next few hours, Mr. Long, what is your biggest immediate concern? And does the fact that the storm is going up the Gulf Coast, uh, which means bigger storm surges, how big a concern is that right now? Storm surge uh, has the highest potential to kill the most amount of people and cause the most amount of damage. Uh, and so, you know, my biggest concern is when people um, fail to heed a warning early uh, from local government officials and then they make a last minute ditch to try to get to uh, a, a shelter or into a facility uh, to withstand the winds. And, and in some cases, the water starts to rise and they get trapped because they didn't heed the warning early. And that's that's my greatest concern. Uh, you know, we, we care about people and try to put that message out. And uh, sometimes people listen and sometimes they don't. It, is it too late for people to try to get out? And I'm talking about people now, let's say, up to, to, to Naples. Is it too late or Fort Myers? Uh, should they shelter in place? Uh, well, it's too late for, for folks in the Monroe, uh, Monroe County, Florida Keys. Uh, maximum radius winds in the eye are moving over as we speak right now. Um, it's going to be very hard to uh, get out of the Keys. Um, I'm sure, you know, if, if you are going to move and leave southwest Florida from, you know, Marco Island on up the coast, your time is running out, uh, you know. And in some cases, if the water starts to rise around you and you become isolated, um, try to get into a facility that you think can withstand the winds and get elevated, get out of the storm surge. One of the big changes in FEMA since Hurricane uh, Katrina is that you folks are now more proactive uh, in terms of positioning personnel, positioning equipment than, than FEMA used to be before. But I wonder with, with this change, because we kept thinking 
until, what, the last 24 hours, it was headed up the, the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, now to the Gulf Coast. Does that mean that you, some of your equipment and people are out of position? Is that going to create a new problem? No, not at all. Um, you know, we've been in great position. Uh, we're leaning way far forward, and, and we've had people and teams uh, in place. I actually have liaisons in 11 counties, uh, you know, on the uh, west side of Florida, working directly with local emergency managers to make sure we understand uh, what the state's demands are and what the local demands are so that we can help backfill their capabilities. Uh, we, we pushed three days' worth of commodities in, uh, ready to go. But, you know, it's going to take some time. This is a complex event because of the the south to north trajectory of the storm. The power is going to be out for a long time. It's going to be tough for us to uh, get in to perform search and rescue of South Florida. We have to wait till that, you know, to, till all the elements pass through. Uh, this is a complex event, but uh, as far as positioning goes, you know, we, we, we've done all pretty much all we can. Finally, sir, uh, you, of course, are still dealing with Hurricane Harvey and Congress just passed $15 billion in disaster relief to deal with that, but do you have the money you need? Do you have the, the people you need to deal with the situation in the southeast United States, Florida and neighboring states post Irma? Sure. So uh, the Congress uh, did its due diligence and, you know, passed the supplemental to allow us to uh, keep moving. And as I've been saying, paperwork and money should not get in the way of saving lives. And I, I believe the Congress recognizes that. There's great communication between the White House and the Congress in regards to emergency management. So uh, right now we're moving forward. I have all the authorities from the president I need to be able to move forward as well. And, um, you know, once this system passes through, it's going to be a race to save lives and sustain lives. Mr. Long, thank you. Thanks for talking to us on this very tough morning, sir. Yep. Thank you. And joining us now from the state capital of Tallahassee is Florida Governor Rick Scott. Governor, does this new path for Irma mean that folks on the Atlantic coast, the East coast, like in Miami, have dodged a bullet and folks on the Gulf coast, the West coast, are now in the crosshairs. Well, this is going to impact our whole state. You know, the, you're going to get the wind and the rain on the East coast. Uh, but right now, um, you know, it's impacting the Keys. It's going to impact uh, my hometown of Naples, Florida, uh, all, all up the West coast. And what's scary is the unbelievable storm surge, potentially uh, in, my, in my hometown, 15 feet of storm surge above uh, ground level. And, uh, and we're talking about that and the same thing with the Keys. So we're going to, you know, people are asked, what can they do? The first thing I tell them is pray. Uh, pray for everybody in Florida. Uh, they can donate a disaster, uh, text disaster at 2022. Or we need volunteers. We have over 400 shelters open now. I need more volunteers for my shelters. I need more volunteers help us distribute food after the fact. Uh, we need nurses for our special needs patients. So we're, um, we're, but I'll tell you, Chris, this is a great state. People are going to come together. We're going to protect everybody. We're going to work together. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure everybody survives this and gets back to a normal life. I, I want to talk about this storm surge. We all become uh, amateur hurricane experts. And one of the things that I've learned in the last 24 hours is that the danger of the storm surge is greater in the shallower Gulf of Mexico than it is over on the Atlantic coast where there's a steeper drop off. Uh, if you're talking about tw 10, 12, 15 feet storm surge, I know Naples, I know uh, Tampa, uh, what impact is that going to have on that coastline? Uh, I, I was talking to the president this morning. He called to see how we're doing, and I told him the story of a hurricane we had last year in the Panhandle. And there was a lady that along the coast. She didn't want to evacuate. She had probably, a, you know, it was a one-story house, an older house. She didn't want to evacuate because of her pets. When it got to three feet, she knew she was not going to survive because the water was just rushing in. Thank God that somebody was, as she left her home to try to get to safety, there was a high water vehicle that was leaving for the last time, and she was able to get in it, and they were able to drive out. She would have died. This water is going to come in very quickly. It's going to cover your first floor, potentially, um, or more, and then it, eventually it's going to come out. I don't know how you're going to survive that. You don't know what it's going to do to the structure of your home. So my, my concern right now is people are, hopefully everybody's evacuated. I looked at our traffic cameras all around the state this morning. People are off the roads. Uh, and I just hope everybody's evacuated and gotten to safety. 
Um, so, and uh, I hope everybody will pray for us. I, I want to talk about this not on the individual level, but on a, a, a bigger level. The last time that a major hurricane hit Tampa Bay was in 1921 when there were 10,000 people living in that low-lying area. There are now 4 million people living in that same area. So what happens when a 10-foot storm surge comes into Tampa Bay? You know, all along the coast where we're getting the storm searches, we did, we, you know, we have evacuation zones. I hope everybody listened, but it's going to be devastating uh, to these areas. Now we're going to, we're going to rebuild. We have wonderful people. This is a wonderful state, but right now with these storm surges, everybody's got to make sure they hunker down and take care of each other. Uh, so, but I, I'm, I'm very concerned.